Hi everybody, good morning, and my name is Graham Foreman from GF International Solutions, and today we have another chit-chat. I've got another great guest, Ross Roberts. Ross, how are you doing? I'm very well, thanks, and thanks for having me. Excellent, Ross, and, and we were saying that I think this is about 80 or 90 for me now, and, and providing some mastery experiences might give some people a clue about what we want to have a chat about today. So do you want to tell everybody about what you do and how you managed to get involved in that? Um, so I'm a, so my name is Ross Roberts. I'm a, I'm a senior lecturer in sport and exercise psychology at Bangor University. Um, and I'm a, I'm a chartered psychologist at the BPS and I'm a registered uh, sport and exercise psychologist. Um, and so I teach uh, undergraduates and postgraduates in various aspects of sport and exercise psych. Uh, and, I, and I do research with um, postgraduates and colleagues. And then I also do some, some, some practice work where I practice in both sport and other areas of, of life where performance is, is important. Fab. So there's going to be a lot of titles there that we need to maybe just break down a little bit and a, and a lot of acronyms. Um, and then let's start yeah. with performance psychology because you lecture on the performance psychology masters at Bangor as well. And that's a new program. Yes, I do. Yes. And that's where obviously it's been great to meet people like yourself uh, and, and, and where I've actually found I've learned as much as hopefully I've been able to, to, to sort of uh, pass on to, to the people uh, so far. So for me, performance psychology is, is, is related, is about psychology in a domain where performance is important. If you take sport for a second, sport's one domain of life where individuals uh, or a key aspect of that environment is about being able to perform at your best and typically performing at your best under um, uh, sort of high levels of, of, of pressure. But obviously that's not the only domain of life where that's important you know performance is important in business it's important in the military in the armed services um in medicine in in education and so i guess performance psychology for me is about taking those principles that might come from a number of different domains of psychology and then thinking about how we can apply them into various different areas of life where performance is important and if you take an example about um anxiety and stress for example some of the some of the principles from sport might apply in business or in education they might look a little bit different they might sort of be um displayed differently but the underlying principles might might come from the same place so for me performance psych is taking some of those principles and then thinking how we can apply them to yeah to sports coaching or to life coaching or to working in business or to doing x y and z yeah no i think that's a good definition and my my business which we We've been around for 11, 12 years now. It looks at business education and sport, which is why I don't have sports psychology in any title, apart from the fact that my, my first master's wasn't in sports psychology, so I can't say that I'm a sports psychologist, so I've always stayed away from that. Um, I, I lectured for eight years in sports science and, and the emphasis around coaching and, and also around psychology as well. Are there more tools available to a performance psychologist to help a person than there is to a, a, just a sports psychologist? Or are, they, are they just a different set of tools, Ross? Uh, I think that's a great question. I think different people might have different views. I mean, my, my view is that we human beings first and everything else second. And you wake up in the morning and you bring with you to training or to the office things with you about who you are. And so therefore, um, you know, sports psychology is about applying psychological principles to sport and organizational psychology is about applying principle, you know, psychological principles into organizations. And so for me, it's about um, the, the best practitioners are able to draw from all kinds of different domains and to take the best of different things um, and, and, and apply them in, in their domain in the way that, that makes sense. So I think if you just, if a sports psychologist ha takes a really narrow view and just focuses on sport or you know, here are some papers that have come out of the sport domain and they can ignore everything else that comes in a, in a different domain. I think you're missing a trick and you're being far too um, narrow minded. And we need to we need to stop thinking about sports people necessarily as athletes first. They're people first and athletes second and business. Well, this is my perspective. And business people are humans first, you know, and then business people second. And so thinking about who this person is. And so that's so drawing from lots of different domains, I think, is, is the best way to practice. Yeah, I, I agree. And I don't know how we miss that. We miss that all the time. We, we look at an athlete and you go, all right, what's my sports psychology toolkit that yeah. I can work with them? And, or the coach is going, what is my coaching technical and mm -hmm. tactical elements I need to work with them? And then actually, if you go back a step, you kind of go, all right. So they're a person 
um, and, and their parents have died or their parents are in shielding, you know, current COVID-19 or they've yeah. just put up with a boyfriend and girlfriend. That's got nothing to do with their performance in sport, but actually has everything to do with it, doesn't it? It does. And so I think so. I mean, I'm, I'm a bit biased here because I'm a personality. My research interests are in personality and in the side of people. So so clearly I'm biased. But at the same time, I think the reason why it's got to that point, and I think it's, the tide is turning again, is that in the old days, I guess back in the 19 sort of 50s and 60s, person and, 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 per, and around that sort of time, and maybe in the 70s, personality actually was a hot topic of research focus within sport. But there were a number of problems with it. So there was a search for an ideal athletic personality, which is a complete myth. It doesn't exist. Um, then and then the, and the research studies that were done weren't very good. So they were really poorly designed. You take a sort of shotgun approach where you measure a load of stuff without a hypothesis, and they were very descriptive. They you know there'd be things like. Um, individual sport athletes might be higher in extroversion than team sport athletes or things like that. They don't tell us anything. They don't tell us anything that's very helpful. And so because of that, I think personality research should have then fell out of favor within sports because, um, you know, there is no ideal athletic personality. We're all different. And, it, and thinking about how we are, you know, and we need to be thinking about how the things that make us who we are interact with environments to produce outcomes. And there was none of that sort of going on. So research has moved away, I think, from personality and ignored it and started focusing on the more sort of skills like psychological skills or sort of cognitions or other aspects that were less, I guess, sort of dispositional and trait like. And then it's only really been, I think, in the last probably about 10 years or so where the, the in the research world and then in, in the applied world, again, it's, it's sort of the tide is turning and coming back to it. And people are trying to, to do better research and to be more theoretically driven and, and understand different aspects of the person and, and, and realize that actually we're people first and we need to consider, like you say, this person's background and um, you can you can try and work on mental skills as much as you want with somebody but if they're in a dark place because of some particular um uh yeah early life experience that you know that might be challenging or actually some of the things that make them challenging people to work with might be the reasons why they're such good athletes and so there's a whole raft of things that if we don't think about who the underlying person is and where they come from that you you, you miss a whole lot of stuff yeah, so I, th I think it's going back in that direction now. It, it's really nice to share that connection with you because my, my undergrad in the States, but, um, which was about 400 years ago, by the way, um, you do my majors and minors in the States. And my minors degree was in cultural anthropology. And, and it is a 19 year old starting to really reflect on the world and, and about different people and different cultures and, you know, genders and, and race and, and everything that comes with that. And just trying to trying to delete all of that bias and just look at the person that's in front of you really interested me. And when I link that to psychology, that's one of the things which I really looked at over the last sort of at least two decades about personality traits and behaviors. So with that in mind, and I know sports try to try to bring that in a little bit or especially over the last decade you know oh well maybe two decades with Myers-Briggs um, you know DISC uh, th those kind of assessment criteria spotlight uh, insights those kind of things do you do you guys use them much what are your thoughts on doing some personality profiling um, I think the idea of person the concept behind personality profiling I think is brilliant and I think but like anything it's the devil's in the detail about how you do it um, so I think that the, some of those tools that are I'm not I'm not in, I'm not familiar in detail with a lot of those tools. I know broadly about a lot of them, but the sort of the specifics of them. And so I need to be sort of make sure I'm, I'm fair in what I say. Um, I think those are great in the applied settings to to um, to enable a practitioner to have a conversation with somebody or to understand someone's way of working or, or something like that. I mean, it, it's interesting from a research perspective that you don't see research papers used with those things in them a lot, not saying never, but they're not commonly referred to in studies that are interested in the effects of personality on something. You know, if you did a search for that, you'd find loads of measures that, or loads of studies that use measures of the big five personality traits or stuff, but you wouldn't see that it being Myers-Briggs or, or insights or, or spotlight. Um, so that's, so that, that, that's, that's one thing that's interesting. I know in the applied world, they have, and um, they used a lot. I, we don't tend to use them. So for the past few years, we've worked, well, really our 
in our department, we've been working with England Wales Cricket Board for maybe 12, 15 years on various different aspects. And as part of some of that work, we, we work with them on developing some individualised approaches to, um, to helping people perform under pressure. And a lot of that's based on personality and other things. And we don't use any of those measures. We take a bit more of an approach of what does the empirical literature say on variables that seem to be related to performance or performance breakdown? And, and we measure a, a number of different aspects of personality and then try and put those together. So um, I guess we stay, we stay a bit close to some of the empirical literature and theory that we're, 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 we're sort of more comfortable with. Um, so we do that. And it doesn't necessarily give you as clean an output as, you know, you might put all your numbers into a spotlight or an insights profile and you get this thing out that's a nice, helpful paragraph. We don't get that, but we work with sort of six or seven of us, look at these data together and try and make sense of who this person is based on a, on a, on a whole raft of things. So I tend to take a slightly different approach to it, but that's just because of the, the, the sort of the area that, that we work in. I think any a, any one tool can have real value, but any one tool in isolation is always is always limited. And so it's, it's about making sure that you use it for the right reasons. I'm going to have to stop agreeing with you today. You know, it's it's an early morning session. I'm agreeing far too much. Um, I had a coach who, who um, an international coach who I've worked with for maybe six, seven years now. And and one of the things that we first discussed was he had a variety of different um, different tools that that had been used with the national governing body that he was from at the time. And we sat down and he said, "Oh, I have this, and I have this, and I have this." Not wanting to be disrespectful to the tool, I said, "Okay, well." Why, why do you want to work with me then? And he said, well, what do I do with them? And what had happened is he'd gone through the assessment criteria, had that really nice paragraph that you discussed, but then there'd been no change. There'd, there'd been no work afterwards. So I, I agree, I like them. I think there needs to be some work done before them. I think you need to, when you see them, there needs to be some reflection from the person that you're working with, but you also need to talk them through the process. And then there needs to be some work afterwards in terms of what strategies and interventions are going to make that shift. Otherwise, they've just got this really nice, colourful document which sits on their laptop and there's just no change. Yeah, and, and I think for, I, I, I agree with a lot of that. And I think there's also some things about, you know, those the they might be used for different reasons than 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 they might you know, in the scientific and, and sort of community and, and everything else. And um, yeah, and, and for some people, knowing that you're warm, blue, or green, or yellow is that could be really helpful. But for me, that that's not how I think about the world. I want to know well how much of a perfectionist is this person? What's their level of neuroticism? How much of an extrovert are they? You know, what are they like with regards to this? Are they a bit narcissistic? Do they have issues? Do they struggle with their emotion regulation or something? So I, I want to know those things because that helps me get a, a clearer picture of things that we know are seem to have some relevance to, to the domain that we work in. So, I, but that approach that we've taken in, you know, in, in the past might not always work in other settings. It works in that setting. I think it's about, you know, it's, it's about pointing the right tools or the right set of processes at, 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 at the situation that you're working in. Which I think if we go back to sport, that's just generally good coaching, isn't it? You look at the person in front well, of you, you see what you've got, and then you give them the right bit of coaching advice. You, you would, yeah, exactly. You, 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 you would hope that. But it, it, it's interesting how, yeah, when you sort of going back to what you said earlier with regards to, you know, sports science training, sports science degrees, and you know, and and just the domain has historically, you know, has it's moved away from that so it's coming back but you know so much focus on skills and strategies that's not that those things are not important of course they are because they're the things that you can do something with but you need to we we, we need to be doing those things or helping people use those things with regards to um understanding who that person is in the first place and there's i think a second issue that with a lot of that sort of focus on mental skills the best people often about uh, uh, delivering that sort of stuff are coaches because they're the ones that have, um, you know, really good rapports with athletes, spend lots of time with them. And then they're actually really good at putting those things into practice. And actually, we need to be helping coaches get even better at those things. And then that actually frees the psychologist time up for doing other things, you know, perhaps dealing with more complex issues. Um, yeah, thinking about you know, other things at a more organizational level or something. So I think it's just a bit of a bit, trying to shift that thinking patterns a bit I think is is, is is would be helpful but in the domain I think a lot of that probably goes on in the applied world but you know in the sort of training when we're training undergraduates and that sort of thing, it's not something that the research literature is necessarily given loads of, um, sort of consideration to. 
So if I go back to Bangor and all of that research yeah. that you guys have done, because, you know, yeah. from what I've seen recently, but over the last couple of years, there's a lot of research that comes out of your department at Bangor, which is fab. Is, is there still a distance between education and practitioners? And if I was a coach on the ground and I, and I said, right, I, you know, I, I think I want to bring in either a sports psych, a performance psych or anybody else to come and help my team. Um, what, what should I be looking for? Um, well, somebody who's, who you think is good and can make a difference, um, and they might have quite, and different people might have very, like very varied backgrounds. I mean, the probably, you know, the, one of the world's most foremost sports psychologists, Professor Lou Hardy, Lou's retired now a few years. And so, you know, he's synonymous with, with the domain of sports psychology. He's a, his training is in pure maths. So, you know, he's, he, he's a mathematician by training. He, he, he had eight publications, um, he did his PhD in pure maths and had eight publications and then became a psychologist, you know, however many years ago. And so, you know, Lou's background into psychology is very different to, um, say, minors, you know, do a sports science degree and, and, and go on. And so I think coaches or organisations looking for people who, have, who, have, who, who, who are good and can make a difference. And so probably talk to other people that you that you um, respect and, and, you know, and, and, and by their opinions and see if they know people. I think you're looking for people who have clearly have got some background in the domain. So, you know, in terms of first degrees and more postgraduate provision and that sort of stuff. Um, and then there are different training routes that the British Psychological Society offer and the British Association of Sport and Exercise Sciences offer to allow people to um, become sort of qualified, if you like, in inverted commas, uh, psychological practitioners. But there are also other ones as well. Um, and my perspective, when I'm talking to our master students about this sort of stuff, it's there's sort of two things to me. There's a qualification is helpful because a qualification says to an outside person, um, this organization says you have a degree, a level of competence at doing something. And I think that's good because like in lots of domains of life, there are people practicing who shouldn't be, who are a bit charlat you know, who are charlatans or who are advertising that they have certain skills when they don't. Um, but at the same time, you need to be good. So I was encouraging students to try and develop a load of um, other. So I've got my emails on. Um, you, know, you need to develop a load of other skill set. Just because you've got this qualification that says you're a psychologist doesn't actually necessarily mean that you're good. You know, you could you you'd go and develop expertise in all kinds of psychological therapy and practice. And so I think. Um, it, it's about trying to understand, I think if, if you're an organization or a coach who you're looking for, it's probably, you might go to those organizations to, to begin with to say who's read or who's on an approved register. You might talk to other, other sports and just ha have a look out there. There are lots of people who offer their, um, who offer their services as practitioners. And there are lots of people who are very good. And I think it's about talking to those people and see, um, see who's the right fit you could have 10 people who are all equally good, but three of them are great for that situation and seven aren't. And those seven who aren't might be great in another situation. And so it's about just trying to find the right sort of fit. You know, if you're a coach, it's, do you think this person can help you? Can, do you think this person can make a difference? Um, will this person sort of help you with, 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 with uh, what you want? And I think that's probably pretty, pretty standard for every, every walk of life, isn't it? You have good people and not so good people and, and somewhere in the middle is the average person that might fit in or might not fit in. What about what about the, the link between education and, and practitioners? Is there still a big gap? And and, and sometimes haven't haven't been in education, like I say, for about four billion years now, or that's how it feels. Um, I, I know some really good theorists um, and, and people who've got masters and doctors who I just wouldn't want to put in front of anybody because they just can't articulate the message clearly. Yeah. But I also know some people who are incredible at communicating and motivating and, and giving me the best seminar ever, but they have no qualifications. And I, I sometimes think, where is where is the gap and disconnect between education and, and the practical world? Yeah, I, I, I know lots of people that fit into those categories as well. Um, and uh, yeah, the, the, it, 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 it's interesting that I guess... I mean, I, I think it's been noticeable with, with the degree that you're on. Like this year, we've, we've tried to sort of, I guess we probably, most of the people who are doing that are people who are probably, they're really good in the applied domain particularly, and we want to help develop their some of their understanding and also back into how, how it can be further applied. I think perhaps some education programmes might be focused more on one or the other. Um, you know, obviously to do a PhD, 
because of its training exercise. And so actually um, to be a good practitioner, you don't necessarily need to do a PhD and, or you don't necessarily, you know, your level of sort of training only needs to go up to a certain level. It's an interesting one. I think people probably have different, you know, some people go, go into, into sort of university study or whatever else and progress through that for, for different reasons. And some might want to go into a more academic position. Some might want to go into a more applied position. I think trying to improve coach education is a really good idea because coaches are, are really intelligent people and coaches are really good at what they do and all the best coaches are. And you often find that the best coaches are doing the, the, the great things already, but perhaps not with the um, underpinning behind it. Or, and maybe it's okay. And sometimes if you can give them a bit more education, they can tweak something that's already good to make it even better. And so probably, yeah, I think there's probably a, a, an opportunity to try and develop knowledge and understanding of people in the coaching profession a bit more, particularly with regards to psychology. Um, and that's where, um, I think that's where so like, 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 the, like, like our degrees is quite helpful in that. I'm saying that because I didn't, did, I didn't develop it. It wasn't my brainchild. It was a friend of mine's. And, and I think actually he sort of hit a, a, a really good market in terms of people who were very capable already and are working in the real world, doing really good things, want to further develop their knowledge. And I think we were, there aren't those, there aren't very many courses like that around. And I think trying to improve those sorts of things, I think would then probably improve the, the quality of that, um, practice workforce because they've got a, a, a greater skill set and I and even in coach education you'll know better than me because I don't but probably trying to bring in more psychology into coach education and actually you know um, either making people learn some psychology or encouraging people to take you no know, psychological modules or improving some of the psychology coach education stuff to make it really central to what to, to, to what um to what people do and I think one of the challenges is perhaps as well is sometimes historically there's been the view of oh the sports psychologist sits on the side and they're separate to the coach and actually the some of the best psychology is done through coaching when athletes don't necessarily even know they're doing any related to psychology and so it's about trying to integrate it a bit more seamlessly perhaps into the into the coaching setup or recognizing that there are different ways of of using psychology and, and, I, and I think yeah, historically it's more focused on our psychology is over there and that's what the psychologist does and the coach does coaching as opposed to well actually you can you can bring these two things together yeah i'd like to think that the majority of my good work at dome university over the last eight years has been literally just side by side with the coach whispering a few things in in their ear and, and trying to hopefully just influence what's going on from from that point of view instead of you are at the sports psychology or performance psychology session you must listen now because exactly. i don't think that's necessarily the right way to do it um we should give we should give bango a little bit of um a little bit of credit while we're talking about this and especially about the course because i i got originally offered to do my first phd offer which i'm going to go back about 13 years ago now um um, from a doc, Dr. Pat Duffy, who I don't know whether you're, you're aware of um, Pat, but Pat um, set up the whole coaching framework with Sports Coach UK originally, and, and unfortunately is now no longer with us, but an incredible visionary and an incredible man as well. And when I left what was Sports Coach UK at the time, which is now UK Coaching, he, he just said, Graham, come and see me at Leeds Met. And he goes, do you want to do your PhD? And, and he was surprised that it took me three seconds to say no. Um, and I've had a few others since, and I've said no. Um, and then all of a sudden, because of COVID-19, and, and I was sitting during the, summer, during the summer of last year, just doing a few online learning, because I think learning is so important, not just from an, an educational point of view and an academic point of view, but just generally in life, you need to learn and keep learning because there's so much stuff that you don't know. Everything you think you're good at, but actually, if you go out of your domain, there are so many things that you have no clue about that you need to still kind of keep learning. So I sat down and I did a course at Yale. I did the usual, the, the suicide prevention course, the, the mental health, Sports Coach UK, UK coaching course. I did all of them in the summer. And then I sat down and thought, oh, I, I quite like it learning again. And this is an opportunity to learn more. And I knew we were going to be in for a significant period of time. I came across the, the master's degree at, at Bangor, which I don't think will massively change my life and my career, but the opportunity to meet the likes of yourself and, and learn new things. And also the network of people who come on that course is incredible. So there's a couple of opera singers on who I've connected with. There's a couple of guys internationally with that I've connected with as well. So for me, my education has just gone a little bit more wider because of the people who are on the program as well. And yeah. the likes of the knowledge you guys have is great. 
so, so who, thanks, thanks who's, so much who's for the idea? feedback. It's something that is good. Go on. So it was so it's my colleague Dr. Stuart Beattie. So it was Stuart's idea to, yes. to, to try and push this. We've had a successful sport and exercise psychology master's program running for years. And if like you just said, you know, if that that sort of title that appeals to some people, but it doesn't appeal to others. And so we wanted to say, you know, and with our work as a group, you know, sometimes we work in sport, we've also worked in business and doing other things. And so it's like we you know we worked in the military and so you know and we're you know we're psychologists first and psychology about dealing with people and helping people and, and so it's trying it was trying to broaden that out and say actually let's let's go beyond the sport domain solely and focus on trying to help people perform as well as they can and and then so make it applicable to people who work in all kinds of domains where performance is important and then we can you can apply this knowledge to, 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 to that domain and so that was Stuart's idea um, and we wanted to try and make it a distance learning course to try and uh, increase the sort of potential uptake and you know and make it a bit more global or a bit more national and the fact that people didn't have to come to Bangor to study uh, you know, and, make, and make it distance learning which has been a new uh, a new venture for us I um, mean, lots of learning on the way and lots of learning to continue to do. Um, and it's really interesting, the fact that this year has been the first year that it's that it's run. And in some ways, everything that happened with COVID was the worst thing, time for it to happen. But it also was the best time because it forced us to actually get on board with different ways of thinking about stuff. And so, I mean, I've really enjoyed the stuff I did last semester. And I so like I said, I learned as much um, as hopefully I've been able to sort of to pass on to people. And so I, I think it's 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 um I hope it's quite unique in that in that regard there's also sort of relatedly we we, we have a big group of performance psychologists in in our in, in our school and probably one of the largest groups in the uk if not the world and, we, we, and what's what's nice about those people involved is that we we we've got i'd hope quite complementary sort of experience and expertise that we think about the world in similar but not quite exactly the same way and so if you put people together, you potentially sometimes get a bit more than the sum of their parts. And so I think that's hopefully something that that's not to trying to sound arrogant or sort of big headed. It's just the fact that I think it's we're quite lucky that we all get on and think similarly, but not not quite the same. And so you get different bits from different people. And hopefully that's something that will we'll come across across the different modules that you can um, people can apply. Well, um, one of the things which, which I, I feel like I'm going off topic. Sorry, <laughs> that's it's fine. If you watch any of these chit chat, everybody goes off topic. It's great because that's what it's all about. One of one of the things which really interested me about doing it and, and going back into formal education after having so many years out because I, I don't think I needed to, but I wanted to, which I think is the, the big difference is the fact that mm. there's a there's a close link to education and academics and, and to the real stuff that you guys do and you mentioned it earlier ross and the fact that you've worked with you know the ecb and cricket as well do you want to tell me a little bit about how that came about and, and also how do you guys go about taking all of that research and that knowledge you have and then making it real and and because you're doing both jobs you're doing the academic research job but you're also doing the practitioner's job at the same time on a project like that so we, we've worked as as a group we've worked in high level sport for for a number of years and it's really you know it's it's probably starting with with with, with lou back in the probably the 1980s and then the 1990s um and lou has a phenomenal uh record and history in terms of working at the highest levels of British sport for the last probably 30 years and so um it that's probably where it starts um and then we yeah we work with a number of organizations and continue to do so the UK sport the RFU some I, my PhD was part funded by by sport Wales and so there's lots of sort of um, high performance organizations that that we work with and we sort of work on this sort of equal expertise model where high performance sort of sport organizations want to sort of if they want practitioners but they want researcher practitioners and so we have this model where we might have a, a phd over a longer period of time where that phd researcher will investigate a particular question of interest that allows the that has direct relevance to the organization and then uh, it allow it allows them to get some some direct benefit as opposed to doing some research is a bit separate and then usually as part of that model there'll be some delivery in that so it might be working with coaches or athletes or, or, or whatever and so the stuff with cricket as a specific example we're currently on our fifth phd with 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 the ecb and so it started a number of years ago with lou and another colleague 
working with 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 people at the ecb at the time they were interested in some stuff around um trying to develop mental toughness and performance under pressure they were also interested in some talent id and talent development stuff so some projects started with that that then got continued and then there was uh, another project about um improving understanding of group processes within cricket um, and then the one we're currently working on at the moment that myself and Tim are working on is about uh, mental health and cricket, understanding mental health. And then so really as, as it's, and I think the fact that we've got a one number five is a real testament to the quality of the enduring relationship between the two organisations and the fact that both parties realise that everyone gets something really good out of this. Um, both in terms of we get obviously to do good research and impactful research, but the organisation gets the benefits of helping to drive that research and making sure it has relevance and, that, and, and, and has applied practice. I, 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 yeah, it has a, an applied benefit. And so, and then uh, as a side project to that, or, or yeah, in, 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 in parallel to that, the one of the stuff, one of the sort of findings that came out of the, um, some of the stuff that you've covered with Stuart about developing mental, sort of mentally tough behavior and pulling under pressure was how, how certain interventions can be really beneficial in that regard. But all of that, lit, all of that focus was a very much a sort of group based one size fits all approach. And then an ECB were very keen on trying to develop a bit more of an individualized approach to sort of pressure training and the, taking the, the view that pre performance might break down for different reasons for different people. So to try and understand how might we be able to predict that and then understand how we might be able to, um, to to intervene and to and to either minimize the, minimize the likelihood of it or if it does happen how we can intervene and, the, and, and understanding that different sorts of people might benefit from different sorts of interventions because of who they are and so so there's a few of us got the six or seven of us got together on a project with ecb that, that's carried on over a number of years to to, to um to be involved with that and we were involved with different teams at different levels from um, in the county system all the way up to the, to, to the men's senior team and also with them and the women's senior team. I think, I think the really interesting part of that whole case study is the fact that actually the guys that you went with, work with actually went on to win the World Cup as well. Um, and, and over a significant period of time, I think the one thing that people think about any kind of psychology is that it's a little bit pink and fluffy. It's a little bit kind of just in your head kind of stuff. But actually, when we get all past all of that, the intervention and the strategies have to make a difference. There has to be some impact and there has to be some end yeah, results definitely. down the line, doesn't there? Yeah, yeah. And if it is too pink and fluffy, it's not going to work. It needs to be it needs to be practical. And a big part of that last project was that we as the psychologists weren't going to be the ones delivering the intervention. So we work with David Young, who is the men's lead psychologist, and he's doing, he was doing part of the delivery, but a really key part of this was um, we need, it needed to be a, these sort of interventions needed to be delivered, be able to be delivered by coaches. So part, so part of the whole process was profiling these athletes to then be able to pass some information on to coaches to say, this athlete looks a bit like this. And, and here are some ways that you could work with this person, not here are some ways that you must work with this person, but here are some ideas on some sort of things we think this person might benefit from. And that kind of was, there was sort of two parts of that. There's, there was a sort of the, a practical bit in terms of perhaps how you might structure training. And then there was a bit about the sort of more communication sort of thing. How might you talk to this person in a certain way to get the best out of them? And so, yeah, and the whole idea was, you know, it needs to be able to be delivered by these coaches. It's not about, it's no point having an intervention that's so complex that requires other people coming in. You need, it needs to be there by the people who are on the ground in their day to day. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited about this term because I've worked with Durham Cricket on and off for about 15 years. And, and on my little chit chat channel, there's um, Paul Shaw, Shaw, who won the Ashes with the women's team. And um, there's Phil Mustard, who's a professional cricketer, who was at Durham as well. And there's a, a couple of other younger cricketers who've come on who I've worked with. So, so yeah, I'm quite excited to do a little bit of cricket research this term. Good stuff, good stuff. Well, I mean, as it, as, as a cricket fan, and, and cricket probably the, I think that's probably the, as an under 11, I got to the last 20 in for Worcestershire County cricket. And that's probably the, the, sort of the pinnacle of my sporting achievement. And so um, I've retained a, a, a real love of the game over the years. So it's been really nice to, to actually work, do a bit of work with them, you know, and I have to sort of keep the fan bit down as I'm trying to be, a, you know, be, 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 be an academic. But, um, but yeah, you know, it, it's, it's always fun to work with it in that sort of stuff.
It is, it is. And, and before I move on to our second topic, I want to finish off one more thing in the world of performance psychology. Um, and, and that is that if I'm a coach um, or if yeah. I'm in charge of a business, it doesn't really matter. And, and I'm looking to, to make some kind of change. My, my team or my organization's just not performing at the level that I want it to perform at. It needs to go to the next level. And I'm starting to think about who do I go and see but I'm a little bit skeptical on the world of psychology in terms of bringing somebody in because I don't necessarily understand it. How would you go about selling somebody coming in as a performance or a sports psychologist to, to really have an impact on your business or sport? That's a good question. Well, as I don't work in the real world full time, I'm probably not a very good person to ask on this because I probably wouldn't necessarily do a great job. I'm a scientist and a teacher and so they you know and a researcher. And so um, I think, you know, and, and people who work, people who are successful practitioners are very, very good at this. Um, uh, yeah, I, I take this view of it's about trying to help people improve their performance, it's about trying to help people understand or organisations understand who these people are and, and what makes them tick and where they come from. And if you understand that stuff, the more you know about someone, the better you can help, the better you can coach them, the better they can perform. And then the better you can set up environments that help them to thrive. And so I guess for me, it's it's taking the approach of it would be what do you really know about your people, the people that you look after that work for you? How much do you want to know? How much do you want to help them develop as humans? How much do you want to help them uh, perform better? Because, you know, and, and, and often if in the business world, you might obviously try and sell it in terms of, well, that actually has real knock on benefits for your business. You know, if you want to increase your turnover. You know, that's probably the um, you know, that that's that's the hard outcome. But by doing you know, one way of doing that is to actually help the people that you that you employ to perform better and perhaps, you know, and maintain, a, you know, a positive well-being, positive sort of yeah, mental health. And so I'm trying to say that actually these are real key cogs to help you get to your outcome. And that's probably a, a thing trying to make the link between any psychological st sort of work or interventions and how it can translate to a really clear either observable behavior or set of behaviors or improve a set of processes or and that also might have an impact on um, on the outcome that you're interested in whether it's improved profit or if it's in the military it's about increased training rates or something like that um, so I guess that's the sort of thing that I would do um, but I would I would definitely um, go and speak to some people who do that full time and say, how do you do it? Because I'm saying I, I'm not necessarily the, 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 the best person to ask on that. And I think that's where we need to make that connection between education and, and real world, don't we? Because you guys do some phenomenal research. And it's how do we how, how do the practitioners translate the research and then make it happen on a day to day basis with their clients? And I think that that is such a skill set as well. And when, when I see people coming out of university and, and I put my hand up 30 years ago when I first left university and I ended up lecturing um, for my first year before I went off to Singapore and spent 10 years abroad, I was the worst lecturer ever because I had no stories. Yeah. Um, I had no stories. I had no real understanding of communication and, and how to get my point across. And I think that's one of the things practitioners, I think, do really well is they take the theory and, and they turn it into something which is a little bit easier to communicate to the outside world. Yeah, and I think when we do that well, you know, it's 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 I guess what like, it, it's what you can sell when you can sell that to, to to the business people or you can sell that to to the sport organization and say understanding who these people are. I think you can. It's definitely people are definitely becoming more um, accepting of it, and and I think one one of the challenges is sometimes as well is that obviously a lot of the psychological stuff happens behind closed doors, you know, and there's elements of confidentiality and and, and all those stuff and keeping the effective relationship with the people you're working with, and so it's um, it's it's, it's it, it needs people to come out and say actually yeah we've worked or we've employed practitioners to do X Y and Z and actually that's been really helpful and that helps to give a bit more credence to, to the domain. Um, yeah, I think the stories thing you mentioned is really important, actually, because um, when you're teaching and also when you're trying to apply something, if you're trying to apply or explain to a, a person about his personality construct X, you need to bring it up to bring it to life. What does this person look like? Or can you, you know think about this high level performer? They're probably quite high in this or quite low in this. And this is what they do. And so you need to find ways of yeah, getting that sort of stuff across. Yeah, I think I somewhere sit in the middle these days um, because of my age. Um, and I love using the age card. Everyone kind of goes, oh, you don't want to be old. I'm like, I quite like it because it's a great excuse for me to say 400 years ago, I wasn't very good. 
Um, and that might suggest that I'm good now, but it might not suggest that. Who, who knows? But yeah, great, Ross. In terms of performance, psych and banger stuff, I, I'm loving. I'm loving the program so far. Some great new knowledge, some great new context as well, which is fab. But the other thing I wanted right. to talk to you a little bit about was um, was fell running. So okay. that last year, stuck in shielding, I decided that it would be a great idea to run 365 miles for the RVI charity. And as a former tennis player, I used to run maybe one or two yards do something either relatively talented or not depends on if i won the point or not because it's all outcome based towel yeah. down have a banana and then go again so running is always something for me that's been an absolute ball ache but a means to an end so because i had a bit of a goal to do it for the the hospital which which my daughter was in for a significant period of time then i had some motivation i had a goal there i didn't know i was going to have to run most of them in my back garden um and then we finished in october so we set up the little christmas dinner challenge to raise some money for for kids who weren't going to get any christmas dinners which i think is just appalling in this day and age and we managed to raise nine and a half grand we had a, a couple of professional sports people join the team as well you know just to give it a little bit of credibility and to boost the the promotion of it a little bit which is fab but i hate running so i think i'm going to go hashtag reluctant runner but we're now in a new year and i was like what am i going to do this year so for some reason mentally and physically because i think it's not a bad thing as i've set a target for 50 miles a month which is not not significant amount but for me that's a huge amount 50 miles a month for a year so how come you got involved in running and fell running? well as in um, well, yeah, that great question. So I was never a runner and fell running, just as a, as a disclaimer, fell running is, is definitely one of the most important things in my life and I'm completely addicted to it. I wouldn't say it's any good, but I rarely, very, you know, very small periods of time go by without me thinking about it. So it, it, well, I came to, came to Bangor to study actually, and I came as a climber and someone that liked cli rock climbing and, 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 and mountain, mountain walking and those sorts of things. I, I've never, you know, I did a bits of running at school, but it was never any good. And then, so that was why I came to North Wales and being out in the mountains and that sort of stuff. And I've always enjoyed that. And then basically it was, um, as I got a bit older and think about having families and other stuff like that, it's sort of my, and, and, and where we live up in the hills, it was, it sort of, the, the wall, the climbing stuff became a bit more tricky to get out because with, with family and everything else. And then, it, and it was just sort of, I progressed almost from that into, oh, there's the hill above our house and the village. Like, see if I could sort of try and run up there. And then it kind of, progressed and then that took quite a while and then it progressed a little bit further a little bit further and then i started realizing that like walking in the mountains is fine but when you run you you can go even further in the same amount of time and and it's just something about being up in being out in great places and beautiful scenery and up high and seeing for miles and there's a real sort of and it's and it's not like normal running because I, I can't do too much road running. I Road running for me is a means to an end to get me fitter to run on the mountains. Um, and fell running is a very different sort of sport, I think, to road running, uh, because fell running, a lot of it's about pain tolerance and stubbornness and bloody mindedness and things like that. Because often, because often you're running up hills as fast as you can, which often isn't very fast. And then you get to the top and you have to try and run down it as fast as you can. And so it, it's just different to, to road running or whatever. And so I, I, I migrated into it through... Um, yeah, probably through the other sorts of outdoor sports that I did. And then I realized that I was missing, you know, what, what I've been missing in my life. This is the most amazing thing ever. This does something to me that nothing, or does something for me that nothing else ever did. And it's just, then you get really obsessive in it. And it's the same thing for tennis that for you, I'm sure you sort of feel the same about that, but it's just, it's brilliant being outside and you get to go on your own or with your friends. And I think it's something about, you know, on a, yeah, being out in amazing, yeah, being out in amazing places. I like being in, I live in the mountains. I love being in the mountains and being out there and seeing things and just doing, doing things like that and long, you know, and being out for a long time. It's just, it's great. And I guess it's feelings of self-reliance and you don't need to carry a lot of stuff with you. You're moving quite quickly. You get pretty muddy. You fall over a lot, often hurt yourself, but it's just, it's just really good fun. Yeah, that, that, see, that sounds mad. Um, and, and for me, who, who is hashtag reluctant runner, the, the one thing I've learned this year, um, and, and I still think you know we, we should always be learning, but for, for the last 12 months is that I don't like yoga. So I did I did the 30 days of yoga um, on YouTube um, and, and didn't like it. Couldn't get past the, my body hurts 
when I do yoga, having had five operations from tennis. So I can't get past the pain stage. So then the running thing, it, I think is really good in terms of your, your mental health. So having some fresh air, having some ability just to clear all of that stuff that's going on in your head was really good. And, and then when you add podcasts at the same time, so you're adding learning, a little bit of physicality and a little bit of mind play in your head. For me, that, that's been such a benefit. But how many miles would you say you run a, 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 on a month, on a general month? Uh, on a good it, month? It, 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 it varies, I guess. I. If you're a bit back time of year and th this last 12 months, it's thrown everything completely out, out the window. Um, and I don't run perhaps as much as it's like anything. You know, if you've got a full time job and, 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 and you have a family, then that's very different. So if running is your full time job and you're yeah. single you know, and your ability is to get out and do stuff. I try and run as many times a week as I can. Um, and so I try and run between maybe five or seven times a week. Um, and I'll try and do as many of those off road as I can. Um, and so, cause, cause obviously miles is a bit difficult cause running 10 miles on the road might take you, let's say, let's say it takes you 80 minutes, just as whatever, but obviously running 10 miles in the mountains might take you anywhere from 80 minutes to five hours, depending on where it, where it goes. And so mileage, and, and I'm no expert in terms of training and running training, particularly far running training, but there's definitely about trying to have time on your feet. Um, my, I try and often fail at this, that within those five to seven times, I might try and have some, I try and do one of those that's long. And if I can get out for two or three hours, I will, but that often involves getting up really early in the morning. Um, that's fine. Um, Cause that's just the way my, my life is. And I'll try to have some of those sessions to have a bit of structure to them. Um, but try, try and do a two different things. And then I just try and get out and it's, it, I'll try. Yeah, basically, I'm trying to run as much as I can. And if I can, if I could run every day, I would. And sometimes I might go for seven or eight days in, in a row and, and run. Some days I won't. And it just depends on 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 how much time I've got and what else is going on. Um, and and because of you know the, the the racing calendar and so that obviously is completely you know is is not happening at the moment. So it's it's different. If if we if there were races happening, I might be thinking a bit more strategically about stuff. And now our our club thursday night hill rep session obviously isn't happening right now and there'd be lots of things like that that, that, that you'd be doing at the moment i'm just trying to get and run in the mountains as much as possible and time time on feet um that sort of stuff really and just yeah the longer you're out for the the more this sort of you just get used to feeling uncomfortable and dealing with that might not make you any faster but it allows you to sort of get better at going longer yeah, and, and as a tennis player, I don't mind that during the summer months when it's warm and it's hot, which is probably why I lived abroad for so many years. But I, it's a real struggle when the snow on the ground, it's freezing cold. I'm wrapped up like that. My, my gait automatically shrinks to old man running yeah. style. I like that. It's horrible. In, 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 those, in those things, I think I, I try daylight, doing things in daylight is much easier than, than doing it in the dark, definitely. So trying to adjust your day if you can. For those things, I try. I, I either try and have a goal of getting out the door, or I've got to go for five minutes, and then you see. Or you try and think you have your. You try and think I'm going to do this session, not like I've got to go for a run. You might think right, I'm going to try and do six thirty second sprints, or I'm going to do six three minute reps, or something. And so the focus almost shifts from where have I got to run, or where am I going to go? Is I'm going to do this thing, and then so. Because sometimes, I mean, there are like anyone, there are all kinds of routes from, from where I live. And and on dark nights or with the weather's not very good, I often think I don't want to run very far from home. So, but it, and so, so if I thought I've got to go out for a run for an hour, I might think I've got to do some sort of loop. But if I think, right, I'm going to do a session that involves six three minute reps, I could run one mile away from my house and then turn around and run a mile. And then, and so you're never actually feeling like you're very far from home, but you're doing a, a really good session. So, some I try and sometimes think about. What could I, what could a, like, yeah, th think about like a, a structure or an aim for the session. And then it, then often it happens better than thinking I've got to go and do me run. I've got to go and do me hours run or 30 minutes run or whatever. It's think of a session that's got a bit of structure to it. And then the focus shifts to doing that as opposed to, oh, I've got to keep going for another 20 minutes or 30 minutes or 40 minutes. It's right. I've just got to not keel over in before I've done three more of these reps or two more of the, or, or, or whatever. That's what I often try and do, particularly in the winter. Yeah, I can just imagine me lying at the bottom of the mountain with no phone, no reception, and just crying to help for like two to three days. Help, but yeah, that 
I'm sure it is fun. Um, it's certainly physically and mentally challenging and rewarding as well. But I, I, what I'd like to do now, Ross, is just kind of flip things a little bit because I did pass your first module, which I was super pleased about because having not filled in anything academically for about 25, 30 years, I was like, yes! And you still get nervous. It doesn't matter how old you get. When, when yeah. you use that word assessment, people kind of go, and, and we've got a little WhatsApp group among some of the, some of the um, older students. And there's a little bit of nervousness that comes into that group. Ah, oh, the, the assignments are out. And everyone's like, you can, you can feel it and see it and hear it on the WhatsApp group. We're all getting a bit nervous. So I thought I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to switch it and then ask you a few questions and try to, try to test your skill set about psychology and fell running. And we'll combine the two because I know you love both. So uh, if you're happy okay. with that, okay? That sounds fine. Yeah, sure, sure. Wow, right. Question number one. Actually, I thought I should do a little bit of therapy at the same time so we can join them on. I hate running. Hashtag reluctant runner. Okay. Actually, I'm gonna have to cut, I'm gonna have to use that sometime. So my first mile is always, and, and the, my wife used to run for Great Britain 800 meters. Um, and then when she's come out, when she goes out with me, she always says, I just moan for the first mile. So what is that? Where is that coming from? And how can I get rid of that attitude? uh so what what is that so is that there's a physiological is warming up and that might feel a bit uncomfortable or a bit different it's a bit different to the norm um wh where it's coming from it could be coming from a number of places it could be coming from the fact that this is not the norm and that's a bit uncomfortable and therefore i don't like it or it's it's or it you associate with well this is the first part of something in a wider task that i don't necessarily particularly enjoy doing that much and so it makes it sort of doubly um sort of doubly not very helpful um what can you do about it so well what one thing is nothing because actually it's it's it and and try and take the focus of well that's just that's what happens in the first mile it's okay the first mile is going to be horrible and then i can start enjoying it so, so I could just, just accept the fact that I won't enjoy, you almost have to forget the first mile, you just do it um, and it, then it'll be all right afterwards. So that's, you, so just trying to accept the fact that it's, um, uh, that, that it's not gonna be particularly pleasant. And, 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 almost, and almost moaning becomes an important part of the process itself. Actually, that's almost a requirement. If you didn't moan, probably the rest of it wouldn't necessarily be that good. So actually, maybe for you, that bit of moaning and not enjoying it is, is key. And if and, and so that's OK. Um, so that would be my first. I think almost it's OK to moan. That would be my first sort of thoughts and just accept, you know, and, and, and that's fine. It's the extent to which it's going to change. Is, it's there. I guess I've got two thoughts on this. If you kept on running and, you know, and got more running fit and used into that sort of stuff, it might arguably that first mile arguably might start to become less of a chore because it's you 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 you're more used to you you you're more used to to running and your body's more used to the to the the um the feelings of running and that sort of stuff so just trying to stick with it and each time that you each time you achieve each time you go out for a run you're actually we chat about master experiences right at the start you're giving yourself opportunities to be successful and if you get through that mile on on monday yeah it might have been horrible but you got through it so you you build a bit of confidence for i can do it again on tuesday and do it on wednesday so keep keeping on just trying keeping on keeping on and being a bit persistent at it i think is is really good as well if you can do that the the the, the third thought is well there's actually nothing stopping you from running or from there's nothing stopping you from doing it. So if it's really unpleasant, go and find something else. And, and that's okay as well. You know, it's definitely running's not for everyone, but you know, you've, you've, from what you said earlier about, you know, using running is a, as a tool to have some wider benefits and some bigger outcomes. And I think that's an also, that's really, but that's then, then running doesn't become running. Running becomes, I'm doing running to, for, for this, this other thing. So, Therefore, you haven't, haven't got to like running, but you can value the importance of running and your sort of mo motivation becomes what you might call in science, be like I identified, you're identifying why you're doing it. I'm doing it for, for this and, and I value that outcome and I can see how this is important to help me achieve that. So that's really, that's key as well. Remember, reminding yourself why you're doing it. You don't have to go out running on a Wednesday night in the rain because you enjoy it, but you might be doing it because it helps you achieve something else that's a bit that's that, 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 that's a, a really central thing like you're trying to raise money for a worthy cause 
well, that's the thing that gets you out the door as opposed to I'm, I'm going to really enjoy this run. I'm going to really enjoy this first 10 minutes. So I would go with focusing on those bigger picture things that, that that's sometimes what you need to get off the couch or get out the door. And that's the same for all of us. Um, maybe not worrying about the fact that you're moaning and almost give yourself license to moan because it, because that moaning won't happen, go on forever. And, and yeah, and then try and, you know, and then you can get into well, what happened then you can enjoy the next mile when, when, when it comes along. Yeah, I, I think it's something which has been almost a habitual routine. And I, and I actually don't mind it, but I do. I literally will moan for a mile and it'll be on my back stiff and my calf stiff and it's sore and it's raining and it's miserable. And then you can almost measure the mile. And there's got to be something in, in terms of my subconscious brain that goes, right, you've done your mile. You're out now. Everything's warmed up. You're feeling okay. You have to run a mile back home if you turn around now. So you might as well just enjoy the rest of it until you get back home. Yeah, I I, I think definitely. I mean, I think there's, you know, from an evolutionary perspective, you know, if you're going from cold to active, your body's going from cold to being active, then of course it's going to be, it's going to feel a bit unpleasant. And I think also, you know, all those things that are happening in that first mile are normal. And so sometimes when we start doing something, you know, particularly if you're trying to get people from a sort of a sedentary place to start them exercising, they start experiencing those symptoms when they exercise and they might, and they sometimes they think there's something wrong with my body. I'm doing this wrong. So therefore the way to do that is to stop. If I, if I stop exercising, I stop experiencing as opposed to everything you're experiencing is just normal. And so that, and that's good. And your body's working. And so trying to reframe how you think about it in terms of this is my body getting ready for action. This is my body warming up. This is my body getting itself sorted. So then actually in mile two, I can go and do, do the stuff I really want to do. Yeah, I think I think it's just a really good excuse for a mile to moan at the wife, you know. For, that's fine. You know, but if it gets you out the door, that's, yeah. you know, that's that doesn't matter. Whatever gets you out, whatever gets you out the door is the important thing. Yeah, I very rarely moan, but that's my that's my one mile. I go, yeah, that's it. I'm going to moan for a mile. I'm going to be all right. Um, the the next question is, um, as as you run and let's say you do three, four miles, five miles, whatever you're doing, there's a lot of a lot of internal chat that goes on in your head. And you get to the stage where you know, I think I can run five, somewhere between five to eight miles and, and, I'm, and I'm okay. But during that five to eight mile marker, then there's always options. And then the negative options in my head are going, well, if you turn back now, you can do five miles and, and you can go home. Um, if I turn right, you know, that's an eight mile route now. Where do I want to go? So there's all these questions about trying to find a shortcut and try to end the run is one, one I, I think that's probably down to just me and running. Um, and, and two, how, how do I mitigate that? Because my, my way of mitigating that is just going, I turn right on purpose. As soon as I hear that little voice that goes, right, if you turn left, it's five. If you turn right, it's eight. I, I just turn right. And I just have this massive inner conflict going on for, for a while. How do you mitigate that? Um... Good question. So, well, it sounds like you're doing you're doing well already because you've you've got you've got you've got a solution to it. Um, yeah, my wife would call that being stubborn. I think Ross. Yeah, that's brilliant. Be, I think to run, what running is it? You know, there's clearly there's huge amounts of science about running well. One of the great things for me about fairing is really simple. You put on some shoes and you get out the door, and 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 a lot of thing that gets you over the line is, is stubbornness. And I'm a pretty I'm a pretty simple bloke who's a bit blunt and doesn't think about the world too much. And so I actually really like the simplicity of, of, of that. Um, and, and I sort of spend a lot of time daydreaming when, when I'm running. Um, so I, I couldn't, I can't listen to podcasts when, when I'm out because I'm yeah. too busy looking at the scenery or trying to stay upright or something. Um, with regards to your thing, I think, you know, it's, you're, you're, it's, it's in, you've got that inner conflict and you're clearly prepared for it. So you're prepared for the fact this is going to happen. So that's a good thing. You're, you're not ignoring it. You're saying actually this is going to happen. It's like, the idea of um, when you tell, say to somebody, oh, you, you don't need to be nervous, you know, or like, you know, or when, a, when a kid says to you, I'm worried about this, you say, I oh, don't worry. It's like, well, actually, they might be really worried and have really good reason to be. And so actually, you're, 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 you're allowing yourself to have that conversation. I think that's really good. And you're, and, and, but more importantly, you've got an answer prepared. So you, you, you're prepared as opposed to don't, you know, don't focus on the thing that you're trying to avoid. You're saying, well, actually, let's bring it on and let's, you know, and, and, and I'm going to, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to do it. So I think actually you're, you're, you're doing a really good thing in terms of you've got that answer for that internal conflict. And so that's one thing. If, if you start recognizing what that internal conflict is, some people talk about it, call it sort of cognitive restructuring. You actually give yourself 
when that thought enters, you've got a response for it. So it's, and then you can almost like bring it on, bring on this decision, bring on the fact, am I going to turn left or right? I'm going to turn right. And, you know, and I like the, the turn right thing. It, that gets, gives me quite a sort of a clear image in my head. So it's something that you can hang, you can hang on to. So then your focus is about turn right, turn right, turn right. And it, and it becomes, a, you know, something that, that, that's very meaningful. So, you know, for me, it might be sticking two fingers up to the turning left sort of thing. But it, 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 it's whatever resonates with, with, with the person. So I actually think you're doing a great job already. I'd also... You ask, which, things, which, which I found that I've done over the last years, I've mapped routes in my head. So I now know routes. So I now know if I walk out the door, if I want to do three miles, I know the three mile route. If I want to do five, I know the five mile route. So I'm almost getting rid of some of that, that inner conversation at the same time. It's yeah. super, if I go out either on a Saturday or Sunday morning and I, and I just, and I don't have a plan, I just want to go out and try to get a long run in. That's where I know at certain stages, and it's usually when I'm getting a little bit tired or things are getting a little bit tight or I'm getting a little bit bored towards the end of the podcast or whatever it may be, that the brain starts going, well, if you go left, that, that's it. You know, that's a six mile, but you're done. But I know that if I, if I turn right, then it's a little bit longer. But I, I, you start to know the routes and you start to know the mileage. And it's, yeah. it's just very, the, the turn. Uh, I think a couple of other things as well about, yeah, so that, that, yeah, that preparation beforehand is important, I think, in terms of some days, actually, it would be okay to turn left, because yeah. it might be that your body's tired, you need to do a bit less, or you're tired, or, you know, you don't always need to run that far. So, you know, if you work out, that's where, you know, sort of the structure of training routines and working out, well, some days in the week, I need to do this distance, and some days in the week, I'm going to do that distance. That's what that, that also helps, because if you get into your mindset of today is an eight mile run day or today is a five mile run day, you're almost committing to the particular thing that you're doing. Um, and there's also, I think something about after a long run, I feel quite broken, but I quite enjoy that sense. And, and I don't necessarily enjoy that sensation during the feeling brokenness when you're absolutely knackered, but you get home and you eat and whatever else, and then you're hanging out late or having a cup of tea or whatever. And you, my legs often feel absolutely hideous, but you have this quite nice sensation. They feel hideous, hideous. So you can enjoy, I think, the experience of, of, of feeling having worked really hard so that it, 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 it helps to close the loop. If you turn right, so you work, you go for longer, you work harder, you, you, your body, you have some stronger bodily sensations perhaps afterwards, but you can really feel like that's, you can see the benefit of that. So it's like, actually, I wouldn't mind, I wouldn't mind having that thing again. So I'm going to go out and run a bit further. So uh, I love that correlation between psychology and physiology as well and how the two blend. And, and our, a good friend of mine, Ali Dixon, who ran at the Olympics as a marathon runner, she, I remember she always said to me, Graham, whenever you feel like you can't run and you, you're at the end of the run, just remember your legs can run an extra mile. And I always think that because every time yeah. I get tired, I'm thinking, well, actually, I'm not, my legs aren't tired. It's just my brain that's tired. Yeah. And so feed it. I mean, that's another thing as well in terms of getting used to, if you, I mean, even if, I think even if you're running for 40 minutes, you know, for so, you know, anything about feed, feeding it. So eating, you know, the getting used to eating when I go out for a long run, that really helps because it's about, you know, then, yeah, you don't feel quite so tired. You're getting the sugar boost or whatever. And um, so yeah, I think that's a, that, that, that that's great. It's, I think there's lots of ways of, of doing what's for you, but I like your image of, you know, you're 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 clearly up for the 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 in the. There's a sort of a, a combative nature of you're up for the you're up for the the internal decision because you've got a response, and so you get that response prepped, and I think it gives you something that's you feel like you've got a bit of control over it. You're not saying, oh crikey, I'm worried because I'm going to start having this conflict. It's I'm going to have this conflict. That's okay because this is my response to it. So I think that's that's a key that that would be I guess would be a bit of advice to people is try and work out acknowledge that this is probably going to happen and then try and work out some responses when it does happen as opposed to oh it's happening and that's a really bad thing it's like I know that's actually quite a normal thing but what what I can do is to try and plan a good response to it and I think that's where some people need to understand that yes psychology is there to help them with a strategy and intervention but sometimes you you make up your own really good strategies and interventions that 
the theory and the practice go hand in hand and the visualization of the turning right, the mindset, the stubbornness of turning right instead of the left, you know, that builds a lot of resilience in you as well. And you know, if you want to call it mental toughness of one of those 36 variables, I think there are in mental toughness, according to Stuart, then, then it's one or two of those, isn't it? I've got yeah. one more question for you um, on, on this correlation. And, and this is, if somebody who's been injured for example, you know, they've had a couple of you know, knee injuries or, or ankle injuries and, and they're getting out and they're putting the miles in and then they get to five to six miles and they start to feel that niggle a little bit. The likelihood is they're not going to injure it again because they hopefully have gone through the rehab and it should be stronger. But mentally, there's this thought process of I can't go any further than this, this mileage because... It might happen again. How do you help to build the confidence in a person like that to, in order to get them to the, you know, the next mile or the next mile or the next sort of key, key milestone of their journey? I think, well, if so, I guess I'd sort of think, OK, so what does what does theory say about confidence? And if you take Bandura's self-efficacy theory, the thing that according to that, that has the biggest influence on confidence is master experiences. And so being successful at something. So I guess for me, it would be about trying to think about structuring runs and training to have those reasonably successful experiences. So if it's about you running five or six miles and most runners are bloody minded enough that they'll ignore the pain, carry on, and it might have some problem later on. And so that's, again, that's something you want to try and avoid. I guess it's it maybe trying to strip back if it, you know, that if you're trying to if you're trying to increase the distance, maybe you've got to reduce the speed or the intensity. Or, or if you're trying to increase the speed and intensity, maybe you've got to reduce the distance. So it might be trying to be a bit clever with your training and say, right, for this week, the aim is to go from five to six miles. And it and, and, so, and doesn't matter how long it takes because time is relevant. It's about distance this week. So you're focusing on distance. So you go five miles and you might go five and a bit. So And you, and you plan your routes and then you recognize where it, where, you, where, you, where you're increasing. So I, that's and then maybe then once you're increasing distance, then you can start to bring in, well, I want to try, as opposed to running six miles, taking me an hour, I want to try and do six miles in 58 minutes or 50, you know, and so you're starting to increase the speed. And so um, that would be how I would try and do it. So I'd try and help them trying to build some reasonably um, good sort of master experiences in, in, in the training. And to do that you have to try and set really clear goals for the session because if you haven't got a clear aim in mind for the session um it's really difficult to know have you achieved it or not and then you left with this sense of fuzziness of oh, i haven't done what i was expected to do well if you weren't clear on what you're expecting to do in the first place you, you, it's just really hard either way and it doesn't necessarily matter too much what that what it does but even if the goal is getting out the door that's fine if that's the goal you, you get out the door but if the goal is to try and run six miles then it's like, okay, well, I've, if, if I ran six miles in three hours or in 20 minutes, the point is I ran six miles. So I think it's trying to, trying to develop, you yeah, have some really clear goals for some sessions and think about sort of structuring a bit of a, uh, yeah, a period of being structured in, 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 in your training. And that's all really easy in theory. And it's really hard in reality because things like Strava, which are brilliant and you can see your mates going out and there'll always be somebody else who's in a bit different place to you. They're fitter than you or they're a different place. So they'll have gone and run for 28 hours that day. And you think, oh, I wish I could have done that. I was stuck inside doing this or I had to look after the kids or I only had 40 minutes and that's quite hard. And so, so it's, I think trying to focus a bit on what you're doing as much as possible about what you're doing when and where you're at is really key and use other people for um, inspiration and, and, but, but not get, but to try and try not to get too obsessed with well this person did this, but they're in a completely different place in their life and to, to what I'm, what I'm doing. So just focus very much on what you're trying to do, what your aims are and yeah, and probably just, yeah, try and be structured and give yourself some time because there'll always be another time to go out and do something. There's always tomorrow. There's always a next time. And you've got to give yourself an opportunity to be able to take advantage of tomorrow or the next time. And if you do too much too soon, you might not be able to do that. Ross, that's a brilliant ending. Thank you very much for your time. I'm going to do that's what right. I'm just going to go for loop, loop and said that you mentioned about Lou being in mathematician, mathematician in very early doors. And the last six months, the amount of maths that I've learned from my seven-year-old daughter doing homeschooling is amazing. 
I wouldn't necessarily do it the way she's doing it or being taught to do it, but you know, we get there in the end. But no, honestly, thank you very much for giving us an insight into the world of psychology, um, performance psychology at Bangor, but also making it a little bit more real in terms of you know, what you do in fell running and how we can actually blend the two things together to make a performance a little bit better at the end. So thank you very much for your time. No worries. Thanks ever so much for it, for inviting me and having a chance to chat. It's been great.